standards. Um, I'm going to give a, a quick introduction to standards and hopefully try to make standards not entirely boring. Let's see if I have any success in that. We're going to start way back with the cuneiform script and go forward with this. Only three. What is a standard? Um, I found all of these pseudo definitions or elaborations of what a standard might be. They are a norm, a convention, a specification, a requirement, or a constraint. All of that seems to me to be a repression of the scientific um, uh, initiative to try and go and discover. So what is the point of having standards? It's just going to repress and constrain us. Well, what is a standard? Let me give some examples. We have standard measures, we have standard formats, numerical systems, languages, alphabet symbols, and encodings, among others. All these different standards invade our lives. Here, I have a, a question at the top. All of you can understand my question, certainly, because it's in a standard language, using a standard font, a standard script even a standard presentation application. Well, I'll move on to the second line, which is a set of words put in an order. I would ask the question of my audience, how many people are offended by the second line? Anyone? And one in the back was offended by the second line. Brave soul. Two. Come on. It has to be the three. I would ask why you're offended. But then let me go to the third line and say, well, the second line is just the first, but the second line is just the third line without punctuation, without putting any standard language notation on the first line. But if we actually do that, come up with a statement that probably does not offend those who raise their hands. It probably makes them feel more proud, in fact. So we've implemented something of a standard on the language, which is to say we've added some meaning, some clarity. And so to answer the question up here again, our standard of inherent divorce is evolved to read the script. I would say, well, yes, perhaps they're boring, but they are in fact they provide us with information, they provide us with clarity, they provide us with a way to communicate that we are missing if we don't use these standards. So, why happen? It's clear that they help us to do things together. The together part is the important thing. If you're sitting alone in your home doing nothing, you probably have no need of a standard. If you're sitting in your home and you want to play a video game with a friend, you're probably subject to hundreds and hundreds of standards without even knowing it in order for you to actually play that game. So, how? How are we using them? How are the standards helping with this? Well, they support efficient communication, not necessarily complete communication, or rich, or deep, or innovative communication, but efficient communication. Many of the very first standards arose in trade. In order for people to communicate on two sides of economic exchange so that it didn't end up having a war afterwards with misunderstandings. Established uh, standards of communication, name for the script, for example. Standards of measure, of weight, and of size, and so on, so that they could agree easily when they make their exchanges. So that's fine. Uh, standards are good, they support efficient communication, but more generally, more specifically, how they do so. Well, imagine this. If you develop a standard, and then you share that standard, then if those two parties who know about it can use it, they can reuse it, they can use it independently, after having set up the rules, let's say. Then those two people can go out and share it further. They can share it with other people independently. And if they've communicated it, 
truthfully, and the same form that it was originally, then the standard can propagate, and now two people who have never met each other can trade using the same standards. They never even talked to each other before, and yet they don't have to go to war over a misunderstanding that a unit of weight is in fact weight. In other words, there's no need to start over for every communication. This is a huge win, a huge benefit to the exchange of information or data, information and data, money, anything. So it's efficient. So let me give an example. Um, when we do almost anything in our day and age, we are stacking standards upon standards upon standards usually without realizing it. And the beauty of not realizing it is that they become a part of our everyday life. And we have accumulated them in our education so that we can use them effortlessly. And we can all use them effortlessly. We go to school, we learn things about measures, such as geographic coordinates. At the top, I have a set of geographic coordinates. And I suspect that most of you have some idea of what that means. Because you have an education that fills in all the uh, standards that build or built on each other to present this information. So what standards are we following in play here? Okay, it's a standard of measure. It's a geographic coordinate. It provides us a location on the surface of the Earth. It's in a standard format. Four nanodegrees and degrees minutes and seconds in latitude and longitude. It uses a particularly strange and antiquated numerical system that we find not only in geographic coordinates, but also in the hours of the day, in our minutes and seconds. And it's a sexagesimal system. It's a unit of sixties, right? So here we have minutes and seconds each be a number between 0 and 60. It has a very, very long history. So we use that in our mathematics, in degrees and compass, we use that in, in geographic terms, we use it in time. We have a further, more basic standard of numerals. We use the Indo Arabic uh, numeral system, these ones and threes and sevens and so on, to depict. Digits. Well, all of us understand. Everyone in the room here understand that. So we're getting into some seriously fundamental standards. We have a standard language. It doesn't appear very obviously in this um, set of coordinates here, but they are. They're inherent to the fact that we have an S to signify south and an E to signify east. It was based on the English language. They're written in a Latin alphabet. And then we have also some other standards. This typographical symbol right here for the degree system, the minutes, the seconds. Interestingly, if you look at this, I only noticed this when I was doing the presentation. Before. The degree symbol stands for the zeroth position in this numerical system. The minutes are the first, and the seconds, seconds, are the second position. Finally, I'm using a font, Times New Roman. It's not the same as the font for the rest of the slide, but I'm using a, a font here, a standard font, to represent the font. So I've blasted you with standards, and you probably didn't realize it before I thought that was in great detail. So there were hundreds and hundreds of other standards that brought us all into this room. Without standards, my plane would not have flown in here from South America. And I'm sure there were hundreds. And with the projection system and the lighting and the electricity, all of those things are in play. So standards are important. You can't deny it. They help us. As much as they might also constrain the process. So now I'll get into the parts of standards and the nomenclature that will be important to us during this course. Standard terms are what I would call the dictionaries of names that you might put in a database table or in a spreadsheet column. 
things like field names and so on. I put up here a whole list of things that are trying to have a So fields in the database, columns in a spreadsheet, attributes of an object, properties of a class, all kinds of different names that you might give to a term depending on its context. Examples of these libraries or dictionaries of terms include the doubling core. I've got a sort of short definition of what this doubling core does. There are terms about resources, where I put resources in quotes because it's very generic. A resource might be an object in a collection, it might be a publication, it might be just about anything that we want to describe. So doubling core is very generic, it's terms to describe resources. You might also say that these are metadata terms, they're terms about data. So here are three examples that come from the doubling core set of terms. Created, this is supposed to be a date, the date on which something is created. Creator, a person or organization or whatever, who created it, modified another date when this resource was changed. Dharma Core goes another step, builds upon the government core. It's the same idea, but there are terms about biodiversity resources. So we're getting a little bit more specific here. Because we're getting more specific, we're also adding terms, terms that are of interest to us in the biodiversity domain. So, whereas the Dublin Core did not have a country or a genus or an identified by a term, the Dharma Core does. And the Dharma Core creates the definitions of these in a way that it hopes will be useful throughout the domain. To go one step further and give you the idea that uh, we're going to talk a lot about Dublin Core, but to give you the idea that we can go further if we're more interested in something more specialized, the Autobahn Core is a standard in progress about to be uh, brought for a public review that goes further in this uh, definition of dictionary that turns about biodiversity media resources. So it's specifically trying to get at being able to capture information about sound files, photographs, about any of those things in the biodiversity domain. So I've given a couple of examples of terms that are in that dictionary that are not in the more generic dictionaries. These being a physical setting and a subject of meditation. So you get the idea that we can, in informatics, go with further standards and non-standards and standards, always augmenting what has gone before, reusing what has gone before, in the hopes of doing something more specialized and something more interesting than every time we have. Okay, so I have here several other concepts where standards apply. And I'd like to distinguish them from the terms, the standard terms, just quickly to, to enumerate them, we have data types, standard data types, standard encoding schemes, standard data formats, and standard character encoders. To explain what I mean by each of these, these are all going to be problems in data cleaning, data assessment, and data publication. So we're going to have, we're going to meet each of these in great detail. To know what they are, what we're talking about. A data type is a constraint on what the value of a field might be. So, three examples are text, data type, date, data type, and integer data type. There are more. Encoding schemes are another kind of constraint on field values. They tend to be two different kinds. One is a list of legal values. You might call this a controlled vocabulary a list of legal terms, anything uh, that uh, constrains or gives you the list of possible values that are supposed to be in the field. So an example of a, an encoding scheme is a country code. A language code might be um, another one. And these pervade our standards. They help us to communicate by limiting the diversity of information that can go into Again, it's a constraint to keep that in mind. 
Another type of encoding scheme for uh, further constraint on the field value is a range. So latitude, for example, it's not meaningful to have a geographic latitude that's outside of the range of minus 90 or plus 90. So we give it uh, a constraint. A test, let's say, that it's valid. Moving on to the next standard is a standard data format. This is a constraint on represent representation of data within a data table. So two ex three examples here, two in time and the other in geographic coordinates. So what I have here is a pattern that's supposed to be followed for the format of a date period. It's supposed to have four digits per year, followed by a colon, two digits per month, followed by a colon, followed by two digits per day. So this is a data format. It says that when I have dates, I want it to be in this format. It's a constraint on what I am willing to understand about dates. Similarly, we might have one for hours, minutes, and seconds. Or in this one, remember, a format for the format for decimal degrees. Digits on the left of the decimal and digits on the right. Finally, we have character encodings. This may be the least familiar to most of you, in my guess. Character encoding is a really low level and uh, essentially computer based problem that says what are the rules for interpreting the actual stream of characters or bytes in a digital document. And two examples of those are Latin one character encoding. These become important if you've ever had a spreadsheet that you got from someone that had data from various languages, say French, and you put it into an Excel spreadsheet that didn't know about French. You might see some strange characters here. Or when you export it, strange characters might appear, they might not be the same strange characters. What's happening here is a misunderstanding of the software character and everything. I won't go into any more detail right now. We'll see this as real problems later on in the course. We have other standards that we use. We'll talk about them during the course. There are three in general that are important to us in biodiversity and matters. There is the application schema, which is the specification for the combination of all those other standards that I've told it says, in order for me to talk to you about a particular subject, I would like to have such and such a field in such and such a data format in such and such a character encoding, for example. It's a specification for an entire application. So an example of this might be a Darwin call archive. Talk about our work archives uh, in our course in detail. Another would be a common separated value file, something that can go in and out of Excel with ease, following the simple value core. In other words, it is it consists of fields defined by the simple value core that can be put into a spreadsheet using the CSV file. And then I've already alluded. That's the formats. These would be formats that are constraints on the structure of whole data sets, not just constraints on the value of fields. So those might be file types, XML file types, common separated values, text file, JSON, and RDF. And then finally, because we're talking about sharing information on the internet, sharing on the internet requires transferring information. That's done through transfer protocols. That is, telling where and how to send data content or messages back and forth. And those here are just three examples of those. HTTP, which we use on the web page. FTP, which we might use for file transfers. And SMTP for all of those people who are reading your mail right now. So, just to show you that there are excesses, Standards. There are some that we will have in this course, and 
point here is that there are standards that don't necessarily apply to the problem you're trying to solve. You don't have to use a standard just because it exists if it doesn't work for you. I would expand this to address one of Town's points, and that is the, in the primary importance of the primary information. The primary information in collections or in observation data sets may not comply with a standard in any way, and yet it is filled with rich information. We shouldn't attach ourselves to standards just for the purpose of sharing data if we're going to lose those data. Right? Primary information may not fit the standard, but it does have information. So the point here is to include as much of the original as possible whenever we're sharing information. My ridiculous example here of a standard that doesn't apply, you can see, has to do with something so amazingly specialized that I have no idea what this is actually for. It probably has to do with something about the plane that got me here, but I didn't really need to know this. Somebody else needed to know this to get me where I'm going, and that's why I paid a high price on the ticket to follow the standard. So, when the standard or the constraints actually make it impossible to do what we want to do, my point is that the standard needs to be changed, supplemented, or replaced. We don't want a standard to drive what we're able to do. We don't want the standard to tell us what questions to ask. We want the standard to serve us to help answer those questions. And if it doesn't do so, we need to do something. 